Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Those words, that hymn, bring us into this first Sunday as we enjoy the first Sunday of Advent with the lighting of our Advent wreath. And I'd welcome uh, Madeline and Sammy and Raiden to join us up front to light our first candle of our Advent wreath. Thank you. Come back for weeks two, three, and four, and you get to late more. <laughs> Thank you. As our Advent wreath welcomes in, us into this first Sunday, we join together in our litany that's printed in your bulletin. O come, O come, Emmanuel, God with us. Come into our brokenness. Come into our joy. Come into our captivity. Come into our freedom. Come into our fear. Where is our hope to be found? We have hope because God is with us in our past, our present, and our future. O come, O come, Emmanuel. As we wait, May we hear the voice of God in our homes, at our work, even while waiting in line. May we see the face of Christ. Now is the moment. Let us prepare our hearts. In our words, in our hearts, in all we say and do, O come, Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Our liturgy for the first Sunday in Advent um, is found in our hymnals on page 49. Um, and to note, again, as we, we sing and enjoy the Hosanna, um, a tradition that comes um, to us on both the first Sunday in Advent and also Palm Sunday, uh, our women will sing the first part of the Hosanna and the men will sing the second part. Um, and then we, of course, do a repeat for the hymn. So joining together for our first Sunday in Advent, Liturgy, page 49, uh, let's stand as we pray together. Shout for joy, you heavens, rejoice, all the earth. The glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Rejoice greatly, shout for joy. See, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and brings salvation. We praise you, the Lord God of Israel. You came to the help of your people and have set them free. You have raised up for us a mighty savior, a descendant of your servant David. You promised through your holy prophets long ago that you would save us from our enemies, from the power of all those who hate us. You have shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and have remembered your holy covenant. With a solemn oath to our ancestor Abraham, you promised to rescue us from our enemies 
and to allow us to serve you without fear, so that we might be holy and righteous before you all the days of our life. By your tender mercy, you cause the bright dawn of salvation to rise on us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. The voice of the messenger echoes from the desert, calling us to prepare the way of the Lord and to make a straight path on which he may come. Let us confess our sins so that our crooked ways will be made straight and the rough ways smooth. You may be seated as we pray together. Gracious Lord Jesus, you come to us with the good news of salvation, but too often we fail to notice. You come to us day by day, yet we close the doors of our hearts when it seems convenient to do things our own way. We ignore your presence and your leadership. We have failed to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Forgive us, merciful Lord. May we live so that the world will know that you have come. Amen. Through John the Baptizer, we hear the Lord's promise. Turn away from your sins, and God will forgive your sins. Eternal God, ruler of all ages, graciously you come to us in order that we might come to you through the merit of Jesus Christ, strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Help us and all your children to respond to the call of your gospel with faith, love, and hope. God of faith, you created humanity to serve and praise you and even when we rebelled against you, you promised to send a savior to redeem us from our sins. Strengthen our faith in your saving work through Christ. As we chose the people of Israel to hear the promise of redemption through the prophets, may people today believe in your goodwill for all that you have made. God of love, you fulfilled your promise of a redeemer in the life, death, 
and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Grant us the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we may share your love with the sick and the afflicted, with the poor and the homeless, with victims of injustice and discrimination, and with all who are experiencing times of trouble. God of hope, you comfort us through our Savior's promise to return in glory at the end of time. As we await the coming of the Prince of Peace, let us not despair. We long for you to inspire all the nations and peoples of the world to turn to cooperation and nurture rather than to hatred and destruction. God of faith, love, and hope, to you and to you alone we pray. For you are our God, the only God, forever and ever. Amen. And let us stand as we turn to Hosanna on page 239. Returning to page 53. <clears throat> Lord, you have kept the promise you made to your ancestors and have come to the help of your servant people. You remembered to show mercy to Abraham and Sarah and to all their descendants forever. We praise you, Lord. You are enthroned in glory yet you came and continue to come for all who will receive you. We praise you for you are good and your mercy endures forever. To you be glory and power forever and ever. Amen.
Amen. You may be seated. So as we gather together as a community, if there are prayers that we can offer for each other, um, we'd be happy to share prayers of concern or um, for others, loved ones or strangers, prayers of thanksgiving for the ways that God has been present in your life. Um, happy to, to share our microphone as well if anybody would like to, to share a prayer. So. Or you can shout it out if you don't feel as comfortable. <laughs> prayers? At four o'clock this afternoon, I'll be officiating a, a wedding ceremony, a marriage um, between um, some local members of our community who have been visiting with us for a few weeks. Um, Ilya uh, Diaz and Henry Peralta uh, will be joining together in holy marriage here at four o'clock. So we um, think of them at four o'clock and, and we wish them God's blessings upon their union. Um, any others? We certainly hold all of those. Um, we hope that you've had a, a good Thanksgiving with family and friends. Um, we hold those, again, as we said last week, our shut-ins, those who are in retirement communities and our prayers um, that God's love would be with them in this season ahead. Let's come together with a word of prayer. <clears throat> God with us, Emmanuel. As often our greetings on this first Sunday in Advent, Lord, but allow us today to believe it, to believe that you came once, but that you come again to hearts that are willing to receive you, to minds that are willing to be, be challenged and pushed to spirits that are ready to live out your love and justice and compassion in this hurting world. Today, Lord, we sang to lift up our heads and let us sing that again in our hearts and our actions this week, as in with watchful anticipation, we greet the season of Advent and lifting our heads and our bodies and our arms and our hearts to the ways that we can fulfill your love in this world. So be with those who are within our hearts, who need to feel your presence, that God with us. Remind them that you are with all who call upon your name to welcome and to receive you. And in this first Sunday of hope, may we be given a measure of hope today, hope that believes in what is possible even beyond the reality of today. Let us live out that Advent hope into our tomorrows so that when we are gathered together, we will know and see you. We pray as we join together in the prayer that you taught us and your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we conclude this Thanksgiving weekend, we continue to be grateful for the ways that you are um, remembering our church in financial gifts and allowing our ministries to continue. So I welcome um, our offering plate to be brought forward as we again think uh, with gratitude towards the offerings that we've received today. Thank you. 
morning. The scripture lesson this morning is from the New Testament book of Luke. It's found on the bottom of page 856 in your uh, Bible in a few if you would care to read along. It's Luke chapter 21 verses 25 to 36. First we have an introduction uh, to the reading. The first Sunday in Advent brings us into the Gospel of Luke with a warning about difficult times. But what does not change in difficult times? Listen how he reminds his listeners to carry his words with them and to be alert. On this Sunday, where we are focused on hope, where might we find hope in these words? And go on to the bottom of page 856 now. Verse 25, the coming of the Son of Man. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth, distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is, is drawing near. The lesson of the fig. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Exhortation to watch. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. And that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. This ends the reading. I'm not saying this because I think you should do this. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> and I'm not saying this because I think you should do this instead of listening, but I completely forgot that I wrote the Advent <laughs> covers. <laughs> we, we do these things so long ago um, that I just looked, turned over and I thought, oh my gosh, that sounds familiar. Okay. <laughs> I think I did that like last February, so that's why I, if you saw me. <laughs> okay. Don't read it now. Or if this gets boring, you can read it now. It might be better written. I don't remember what I said. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, as Ed shared with us um, in that wonderful reading from um, Luke's Gospel, uh, let me just share the first two verses again. There will be signs in the sun 
and the moon and the stars and on earth distress among the nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves, people will faint with fear and foreboding on what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And those were the cover a picture as well uh, for the bulletin, the signs uh, that cause that fear and foreboding. On the first Sunday in Advent, um, just when you're expecting Christmas is coming and you'll hear something cheery, we typically hear what words in theological terms we sometimes call ap apocalyptic, uh, meaning focused on the end times. Um, historically, there might be words that are drawn from times that were causing some fear and foreboding for the folks while the Gospels are being written down. Um, scholars think that's in around maybe 40, 50 years after Jesus left, and so we all know about Pompeii um, and the earthquake that caused Mount Vesuvius around that same time as the Gospels are being written down. So hearing of signs in heavens, stars, earthquakes or famines or wars. Uh, Rome is now invading Jerusalem, destroying the temple, the centerpiece, the powers of heaven being shaken. Um, we can put this in historical content, but we've put it in different historical contents throughout the ages. Sadly, it seems like in, in any generation, we could find signs outside of ourselves, signs that would cause, as Luke said, fear and foreboding. Um, signs as uh, a few weeks ago, we heard similar words from Mark's version um, describing earthquakes and famines and times of war. Um, sadly, in every generation, we seem to find ourselves situated in times when we can point either within communities or outside of our communities to places that might point to these ap apocalyptic words. So on this first Sunday in Advent, what I wanna focus on is after sharing those few words with you, where Jesus transitions, what Jesus says, and really what Jesus says to do if you just heard and thought and found yourself within any of those times of fear and foreboding. So if you heard those words, or if you've experienced those events that have caused that, and you were asked, so what do you do? I wouldn't blame you if, if your first reaction, like mine might be, to hide in a closet to find as many blankets you could to pile upon your head or to pile those pillows off um, and not come out. And that seems to be a natural reaction, um, at least it might be my reaction, to times of trouble or suffering or destruction. But what are we to do? Um, if we are to call ourselves Christians, if we are to live with some kind of faith despite the circumstances around us, um, what are we to do? Are we to hide out in that closet, to watch as passive onlookers for the next life to come, or are we to do something else? In um, his theological book, The Theology of Hope, uh, Jürgen Moltmann writes these words about what Christian hope might demand of us. He says, Christian hope um, is no longer only being part of that passive onlooking, looking at the opium um, of beyond, but rather Christian hope, he writes, is a kind of divine power that makes us alive in this world. And Maybe that's what Jesus is saying. So let's look at what Jesus says right after those first few verses and where, where we heard of the fear and the foreboding. And Jesus says, so what are you supposed to do? Jesus says very simply, when these events happen, stand up and raise up your heads. Stand up and raise up your heads. Very different reaction to hiding in your closet, burying yourself under your pillows, maybe waiting passively until it all passes by. Followers of Christ are commanded there by Jesus in that turning point in the passage that this is your reality, but this is what you are to do to stand up and raise up your heads. And then later on, he uses phrases like be on guard, um, keep watch, be alert. That seems to be the real definition of Christian hope. It doesn't destroy the terrifying events around us or within us, but it reorients ourselves to the way we react to those events. Stand up, raise up your heads. 
So the first Sunday in Advent, our Moravian liturgy always brings us um, to one hymn, and I'm grateful for Peter's sharing in this hymn, um, and has become a tradition of sort, I think, for, for you to provide our solo voice to the 17th century um, hymn that is by the German uh, hymn writer George Wiesel. It's entitled, Lift Up Ye Heads, Ye Mighty Gates, and we heard him sing that solo verse, which I will not sing, but I will read. Uh, Lift up your heads, your, your heads, you mighty gates. Behold, the King of glory waits. The King of kings is drawing near. The Savior of the world is here. So as Peter did a wonderful job in, in highlighting this uh, in our liturgy, we are commanded in that liturgy, in the, that hymn, to lift up your heads, ye mighty gates. Raise up your heads, and I hear those echoes of Jesus' words. Um, the, the hymn is actually taken from another source, uh, Psalm 24. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. But what's interesting is that as George Wiesel is writing these words, he's writing them in of course, a very different time, the 17th century, but a very similar time to when Jesus is speaking these words and commanding us or commanding his followers in those days of how to react to such events of fear and foreboding. For what's surrounding uh, the 17th century, the early 1600s, what's surrounding George Wiesel? What's surrounding him is the Thirty Years' War, a war that's ravaging lands throughout Europe. Um, disease is rampant, and we hear of other hymns that are being written at this time that are having these amazingly hopeful and, and uh, powerfully Christ-infused verses. Uh, but this is one of them. Wiesel is writing as he's watching the destruction, the fear and the foreboding, the wars and the disease around him. He's writing these words of how to react Lift up your head, ye mighty gates. The king of glory is coming. So, we read this in Advent. Uh, because Advent really, if you think about it, is not the season, uh, of course, of Christmas. We hear this every year in church. But of course, it's a season of preparation. And maybe we can define it using these words as it's your standing up directions. It's directions for how to stand up, how to raise up your head, how to go on with hope. Hope, of course, is defined as what is not yet, what is not seen, but what could be. Um, we hope in what Christ has promised later in this passage that when all passes away, that the word of God will remain, that the presence of Christ will still be with us. Um, and that is our hope of what we do not see now, but what we work towards. Um, so when Jesus says, when all these things, any form of suffering or fear or destruction happens, lift up your heads, stand up. He's speaking of the ability to hope, to allow hope to triumph over the reality of the present experience. As Peter Gomes wrote, writes, um, Christian hope is meant to guide you into the place where you have not yet been, uh, into becoming the person that you have not yet become. So Christian hope is to guide you into the place where it is not yet, um, into what is not our reality, but to allow us to imagine what could be. Um, so Gomes writes about this, and I wanted to share, um, as we think about hope, and maybe just dive a little bit deeper into what hope could be. He shared, um, he's a, uh, a former pastor and uh, chaplain at Harvard University, and in one of his, um, sermons, Advent sermons called The Courage to Hope, he shares just a brief story about what hope might be. And uh, maybe if we think about hoping too little, we might find this kind of amusing. So he writes about a, um, a story of all of the different ambassadors that are, are being uh, interviewed by a, um, I guess it was the Washington Post. And each ambassador is being asked, what do they hope for for Christmas? And they came over to the, uh, the British ambassador and asked him, Mr. Ambassador, so what do you hope for for Christmas? And he writes, well, being a British reserve, um, not wanting to appear greedy, but also truthful, he said what he really wants for Christmas is a, a jar of fruit preserved in ginger, like you might find at um, the, the uh, great London store Harrods. Um, 
So what he really wanted was that, and he, he sold the interviewer that in detail. A few days later, the uh, Washington Post published the uh, article about what each ambassador had hoped for for Christmas, and he wrote um, in the article that the Russian ambassador hoped for peace and goodwill, the Swiss ambassador hoped for genuine disarmament around the world, the Spanish ambassador hoped for Gibraltar to be given back, and so forth, and Sir Nicholas, the British ambassador, was recorded as hoping for a jar of preserved fruit. So sometimes we hope for too little, he was reminding us. Um, sometimes hope is intentionally meant to push us into the reality that not, is not now, but could be, uh, to allow our imagination stir, even if that reality will not be fulfilled in our lifetimes. Um, so really remembering on this first Sunday in Advent, not hoping uh, for too little, but to hope big. And as I conclude, I just thought a few lines about what uh, gives me hope uh, for this church and this community. I see hope in this community because of the glimpses that I see it uh, in a community that can model love and compassion in the ways that church can be a place of intentional difference coming together. Um, whether it's political differences, gender, sexuality, race, the ways that we can love bigger than who we are and who the world often divides us into. I hope that uh, the ways that I see us intentionally trying to look outside of ourselves, to be relevant, to be realizing that our message of Christ's love is the same, and yet sometimes the way that we present the message needs to be different. And so we engage in those questions, and that gives me hope. And I hope not because, as, as Jesus said in those words, because we're ever going to live in a time uh, when we'll be free from suffering, when we won't have those moments of fear or foreboding, but because we are given some standing up directions this Sunday, some of the ways to raise our head up, uh, because we know how to model living in hope, living with heads raised high, even when we don't know the way for certain. Again, Peter shared the, the hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins, release us. Let us find our rest in thee. It's not a time, today or any day, um, to go into the hiding position when moments of fear or foreboding surround us. It's not a time, Jesus says, to enter the closet or whatever safe spot would make us a passive onlooker. It is a time to live with hope, uh, to raise your heads, and to stand with the presence of Christ. Amen. So our hymn, as we end our worship time together, is 256, Rejoice, Rejoice, Believers. Let's stand.
And may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Go forward and serve the Lord. Amen.